It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here with a special series brought to you by the NEI Podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts, with one part released each month. This This next theme is on dark psychiatry and coercive persuasion. This theme focuses on Dr. Joel Dimsdale's new book, Dark Persuasion, on brainwashing and social media, and on the dark side of neuroplasticity. Let's listen in to part one, The Power of Dark Persuasion with Dr. Joel Dimsdale. Welcome again to another NEI podcast in our Psychopharmacology series. This is Dr. Andy Cutler, and I'm really excited today to uh, be talking with the author of a really fascinating book that was just published August of 2021 called Dark Persuasion, a history of brainwashing from Pavlov to social media. And uh, joining me today is Dr. Joel Dimsdale, the author of the book. He's a professor emeritus at the University of California, San Diego. Hello, Dr. Dimsdale. Hi, thank you. It's good to be here with you. Well, I'm really looking forward to learning more about this topic, uh, which is really so relevant. And joining us today, as always, is the inimitable and and, uh, colorful Dr. Stephen Stahl to provide some commentary. Hi, Steve. Hello, hello. And Joel's a longstanding good friend and colleague in the same department of psychiatry together here at UCSD. So welcome to Joel. Now, I want to get going here by just kind of starting out with a little bit of a naive question, but how did you come about to writing this book? What was the impetus for this? I've always been interested in why people make dreadful decisions and harmful decisions. And I've been interested in the context of history. My last book, Anatomy of Malice, examined the Nazi cabinet ministers and tried to figure out what drove their behavior. How did they make the decisions that they did? That was a very interesting project, but I realized that got me nowhere in terms of the wider population. Generally, when one looks at whole populations running amok, you have a choice of perhaps three alternatives. One is that by default, they are evil, or that some countries or peoples make bloodier decisions than others. Another is that it is propaganda. And then the third is brainwashing. And as I thought about this crazy word, where did it come from? How did it come about? So that's when I started reading lightly into the history of brainwashing. But honestly, I probably never would have written the book if it had not been for my neighbors. I had lived up in the North County area of San Diego, and my neighbors had themselves castrated and then embarked on a mass suicide so that they could catch a flight on the Hale-Bopp Comet to eternity. And with that Heaven's Gate commune being literally next door, Mm -hmm. I felt that one really needed to look at the history of brainwashing. What is the difference? You've mentioned propaganda. What is the difference between brainwashing, propaganda, and disinformation? Well, that's one of the big problems. The term brainwashing is so flamboyant that, you know, scholars don't find it a very respectable topic. I see. And it it has, if you kind of imagined a word cloud with brainwashing as the overarching theme, there would be certain other concepts embedded in there. There would be indoctrination. Mm-hmm. There would be persuasion. Mm-hmm. There would be conversion. I think what differentiates brainwashing from these other concepts is coercive persuasion. The person is 
coerced to change his behavior and arguably his thinking. Where did the term brainwash come from or brainwashing? The, the term appeared in 1950 in the mm-hmm. hands of a retired OSS propaganda specialist named Hunter. Mm-hmm. And he used it to refer to what was going on in China as Mao Zedong took over mm-hmm. and also in the emerging Korean conflict but he borrowed the term from a Chinese term, Xinao, which really means something entirely different. In Xinao, the, the idea is that one retreats into meditation to clarify one's thinking and purify one's heart. But he translated that as brainwashing, which he described as a fiendish communist endeavor that would wash away the souls of people and force them to follow a new ideology. So he radically restructured the original meaning of the term, but it was yes. it caught on. It was mm-hmm. enormously infectious as a term. The experts at the time of the Korean War greatly preferred coercive persuasion as a term, but it never caught on. I did a Google search on the terms mm-hmm. And it's curious, but if you look up brainwashing, it has something like 35 million web pages. Oh and if goodness. you look up, if you look up coercive persuasion, it's 48,000. Oh so goodness. for for better or worse, we're stuck with this flamboyant term of mm-hmm. brainwashing. And I kind of will slip into it as a shortcut, but I mm-hmm. much prefer coercive persuasion. Well, actually, cool. Joe, Joe yeah. can I ask, what's the difference between brainwashing someone and psychotherapy? Well, you know, that is a colorful question. The um, <laughs> color colored it, coded it in here. <laughs> so Jerome Frank, many years ago, wrote an enormously influential book called Persuasion and Healing. He asked the question, what is there about the guts of psychotherapy? How does this healing take place? Isn't it a form of persuasion? Is it a form mm-hmm. of education? Is it a form of belief? So there are lots of things where people are persuaded to believe or do things differently. But the essence of brainwashing is that it is coercive. The person mm-hmm. cannot escape it. In psychotherapy, the patient can always leave, assuming he or she is a voluntary patient. So persuasive techniques can be used for good or evil, essentially, <laughs> you know, if I want to make it simple. Well, then I've got another colorful way of asking the question. I've often thought of this. You know, the listeners here, they're probably very interested in these therapeutic kinds of uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. which borders on this, and you get into this when maybe some evil uses of these same medicines. But, Joe, are you talking about, I'm going to give you an oxymoron to ponder, therapeutic brainwashing when you're actually doing psychotherapy during psychedelic experiences? Or is, or is that an oxymoron? I'm not talking about that. <laughs> 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 I, I think we're, maybe we'll get into it a little bit about the whole use of medications and what role they have in augmenting thoughts or ablating thoughts. But I think f- so far, at least in terms of the coercive persuasion literature, people haven't dived into that. There was a brief flurry of interest in psilocybin by the Nazis. And in America, there was a protracted interest in LSD, but it wasn't, at least in the CIA hands, it wasn't viewed as an adjunct to psychotherapy. Although some of the earliest investigators on LSD were using it as an adjunct to psychotherapy. That's certainly true. Wasn't there quite a bit of research done by the government on certain medications to try to get people into a state where they would confess things and almost like truth serum? Sure. And that, well, to a certain extent, we're talking about the history 
of psychopharmacology. Are medications able to relax someone, to make someone more comfortable confiding? Are medications able to change the mindset of an individual so that Mm -hmm. he or she suddenly sees the world differently? Mm -hmm. Are medications able to disinhibit somebody Mm -hmm. so they're less cautious? All Mm -hmm. of these have roots that extend way before the Korean War. Arguably, Pavlov was very interested in bromides. And Mm -hmm. in the 20s, a number of investigators throughout the world discovered the ability of barbiturates that could miraculously allow a catatonic patient to move and talk in a way that Mm -hmm. had not been possible before. So there were these remarkable interests that converged on drugs and behavior, and it converged from other other specialties as well. A lot of it came from obstetrics. Hmm. Can you elaborate a little on that? Well, it goes back to Queen Victoria and painless childbirth. I see. Uh, the uh, obstetrician administered what was known as Dommerschlaf, which was a combination of medications. And it was miraculous and it caught on. Mm-hmm. People mm-hmm. started using this after World War I uh, as potential treatment for shell shock or its many other synonyms. The, the field of the, the quest for truth serum really took off at the start of World War II. There was always the suspicion that Stalin had used some sort of medication to elicit confessions during the purge trials of the 30s. But when war ensued, it became an urgent matter of public policy for the Nazis and the Allies. Could we find some drug that would allow us to extract information from an agent of the enemies? Or alternately, could we find a drug that might protect our own agents from such Mm -hmm. invidious medications of the enemy? And people just hopped to that with a great amount of vigor. The Nazis tested it on concentration camp inmates at Dachau. They were kind of uh, underwhelmed by the data, Mm -hmm. felt that, yes, they could get people talking, but sometimes when you loosen people's tongues, you get nonsense. So (laughs) it wasn't necessarily the royal road to extracting the truth. The, The Americans were keen on marijuana. It was so interesting because Anslinger, the man in the United States who did more than anyone to persuade the the government that marijuana was the demon drug, he was on the commission that endorsed studying marijuana as a truth serum. And we as a country fiddled with oral extracts, we fiddled with vapors, we fiddled with all, all sorts of things. And learned that marijuana, yes, is somewhat disinhibiting and somewhat relaxing, and maybe people would lower their guards somewhat, but there was no evidence that it could extract uh, a state secret. That's where academia came in, because they needed us, the government needed us to design clinical trials to vet this stuff, to set up analogs in a laboratory and see whether people could keep keep a secret or not. I understand there was a lot of government money flowing here. There were grants flowing into academia for this. The, the government money hit in the 50s and 60s. It has sometimes been called the Manhattan Project of the Mind. Right. So that that conveys the scope of the government investment. And it involved psychiatry, psychology, neurology. There were brilliant people and there were some sloppy scientists uh, as well who were involved in this. My book really tries to ask how people did this. I'm interested in this collision between the individual and social forces. 
And mm -hmm. it was quite striking to me to see the remarkable range of people, people, the head of the American Neurological Association, Harold Wolf, the head of the American Psychiatric Association, Ewan Cameron, famous scientists participated in this. And some of them did some really appalling research. Could you give us some examples of this? Probably the most notorious is Ewan Cameron, who mm -hmm. basically practiced up in Montreal. Ewan was, ha had great training. He never saw an intervention he didn't like, and his attitude was more is better. And he did that with everything from infrared light mm -hmm. to insulin coma therapy. What he didn't do was inform his patients that they were being studied, number okay. one, mm -hmm. and that he was being funded by the CIA, number two. And it should be added that these, you know, sometimes we will do experimental treatments on patients who are terribly impaired and have mm -hmm. failed in all sorts of treatments. And people will try a Hail Mary pass to see whether something might work. Cameron did this on everybody. He took routine patients with anxiety, depression, postpartum depression, and he treated them with huge doses of ECT. I, uh, hundreds of doses of ECT combined with insulin coma, combined with LSD, combined with sleep restriction, and then sleep therapy. Cameron was an impatient man. He didn't have the time for psychotherapy. And mm -hmm. his attitude was that if we just obliterated people's memories and started afresh, this would be the royal road to treatment. So he was very good at obliterating memories, mm -hmm. regrettably. But to teach people new ways, he had this idea of sleep learning. So basically, he extracted from psychotherapy what he felt each patient's core issue was. And he played this in a tape loop in a speaker under the patient's pillow or in a helmet. And wow. he would repeat this up to a quarter of a million times. Things like, Jane, you are a good mother. You love your husband. You love your children. Pete, you need to be more assertive. These kind of messages over and over a quarter of a million times. When he was all done with this... He could demonstrate that memories were altered, but he could not demonstrate that people had changed in any way their fundamental beliefs or behaviors. Well, that sounds more like brainwashing than coercive persuasion to me. I mean, literally washing the brain of memories. <laughs> yeah, literally. But Cameron was, a, Cameron was an incredibly sloppy experimentalist. Mm -hmm. And it's embarrassing to say that, given mm -hmm. that he was the head of the APA and, by the way, the World Psychiatric Association. If you look through his laboratory notes... He violates almost every guideline of how clinical trials should be operated. He changed the eligibility. Mm -hmm. If somebody didn't do well, he dropped them from the study and never included their data in the reports. Right. He basically said that he was the arbiter mm -hmm. about whether a patient got better or not. Now, in contrast with Ewan Cameron, Harold Wolf at Cornell Mm -hmm. was an extremely prominent neurologist, but he was even more ethically challenged in that I mean, Cameron at least was trying in his incompetent way to help patients. Wolf basically proposed a series of studies that were very damaging to people mm -hmm. and asking the CIA to make the subjects available and then to dispose of the subjects when he was done with them. Hmm. So one, one sees these awful things that developed in the 50s. I should mention, by the way, I'm a nut about Jason Bourne. I, I don't know whether anybody else <laughs> likes the books or likes the movies. This is Ewan Cameron. 
So if you recall the plot of Jason Bourne, you've got this somewhat unhappy young man who goes Mm -hmm. to an avuncular psychiatrist Mm -hmm. who says, "I, I will wipe out all those unfortunate memories and I'll teach you to do other things. Now, the movies, they teach Jason Bourne to become the consummate assassin. Thankfully, you you and Cameron never did that. But basically, this was some of the origins of the Jason Bourne series. Fascinating. Well, Joel, isn't that what we're trying to do in a more helpful way with having post-traumatic memories eliminated so that you don't, in other words, you forget your trauma? Fair enough. I think the question with brainwashing was whether you could be precise. Could you extract a given memory or could you ablate a given memory? And I think the data on that, at least in the brainwashing literature, was almost non-existent. Today, in terms of trauma, absolutely There are millions of people who would give their eye teeth if they could unremember some traumatic events. And Mm -hmm. I think there are efforts to look at that. I, I, I think the issue of the time frame, how if you think of memory as a time loop, can we extract, edit out 20 minutes of memory I don't think we're there. We may be able to certainly interfere with memory consolidation for a day or two, but being precise about that is, I don't think is possible in today's uh, science. Keeping up with the latest in psychiatry shouldn't be a struggle. SynovianFieldMedical.com is a new website for clinicians where you can find a library of free, hand-selected resources such as videos and infographics on important psychiatry topics. You can request an educational program for your practice or connect with Synovian medical professionals in your area. Synovian wants to help you get all of your psychiatry questions answered. Go to synovianfieldmedical.com and explore what Synovian has to offer. Now, we've talked a little bit here about blading memories. We've talked about having a sort of truth serum, but we haven't really talked about the coercive persuasion part of this and getting people to, for instance, follow a charismatic leader or join a cult, uh, which we started out with, of course, with Heaven's Gate. Take me into that realm. How how do we get to coercive persuasion, per se? Well, there's always been an overlap, an interesting overlap, between religious conversion and Mm -hmm. coercive persuasion. And it's important to acknowledge that religious conversion comes in different flavors. I'm not talking about flavors of religion, but in Mm -hmm. different contexts, there are Mm -hmm. state-sponsored religious conversions that people will reluctantly follow or come to appreciate or dissemble and pretend to follow. This has been going on for millennia. Mm -hmm. But if you look more at conversion on an individual level, start to see that people drift in and out of new religions or new beliefs. And what's different about coercive persuasion is that the door is closed and they can't Mm -hmm. drift out. That's important. Because if you look at new religious movements, social scientists and scholars of religion have examined the influx and efflux of newly converted people. And depending on the the religious group, after a year or two, 80% of the new converts have left the movement. So Mm -hmm. in a non-coercive conversion, there's a door. The person can leave. In coercive persuasion, that door is either literally sealed or else made very difficult to get beyond. Mm -hmm. If you look at 
Jonestown, for instance, the almost a thousand people perished, over 900 people perished in this mixture of suicide and homicide mm -hmm. in Guyana. Mm -hmm. Jonestown, first off, was in the middle of a, a jungle and isolated from mm -hmm. everywhere. Secondly, there were fences, barbed mm -hmm. wire fences and armed guards mm -hmm. that blocked people from leaving the commune. People were told it's risky for you. There are jaguars out there or there are mercenaries out there who will kill you and thus we have to stop you from leaving. Many, many cults control access to the outside world. Mm -hmm. Members are dissuaded from interacting with their families I or see. friends or acquaintances so that their only social environment and interactions uh, are with other members of the group. This is a recipe for disaster in terms of extricating a person from such a movement. Yeah, so so when we're talking about cults, obviously there is a coercive persuasion going on. How does that happen within a cult? How does a cult utilize coercive persuasion? There are certain common ingredients that if you're gonna if you're gonna make a cult, make a, make like bake a cake, you're gonna need certain things. You're going to need to control the door. You're going to need to interrupt your members' sleep. That's very important. If you interrupt people's sleep, they become more suggestible. Considerable research in today's sleep labs demonstrates that. You also, to use Margaret Singer's wonderful, cults thrive by love bombing their new <laughs> members. So you come in, Andy, I say, Wow, you look terrific. You're straight from Puerto Rico. You look fresh and well rested, and etc. And and we compliment your attire. We compliment your appearance. We compliment your intelligence. And the new recruits to a cult are love bombed so much that mm -hmm. they lower the guards. And of course, don't they often kind of prey on people who have maybe lower self-esteem or are looking for something or more suggestible? People in new religions resent that assertion, even if it's accurate. So why do you, why does one convert from religion A to religion B? Because mm -hmm. Something is missing in your mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. something is unsatisfactory, because mm -hmm. you something makes more sense to you in the new religion. Now, when you look at the literature on conversion, well, let me pause for a moment. One of the things that I enjoyed about writing this book was that it gave me an opportunity to delve into a number of tangential areas that are extremely relevant. And if you look at the sociology of religion, you find that indeed about 70 to 80 percent of new converts describe themselves as being at a dead end, as mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. despondent with their lives. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, they are typically at the common age of onset of psychiatric problems, typically mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. late adolescents and mm -hmm. in their 20s. Mm -hmm. So from a, a demographic point of view, the person who con converts is frequently at risk to begin with. So they're vulnerable. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it seems that cults prey on, if you will, people who are vulnerable, who are looking for something, looking for meaning or belonging. And in some ways, isn't that what people are searching for in religion as well? Well, aren't we all looking for meaning and belonging? And the problem is where you look for it and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what you can do if you change your mind. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, we make bad decisions every day of our lives, and hopefully they're not permanent bad decisions. Mm -hmm. With cults, it gets to be very difficult to extricate oneself. Right. I'm, I'm just thinking about this primal need, this primal drive almost that we have to belong and to find meaning and value. And it seems to me that uh, sometimes political movements can also suck people in, if you will. 
Sure. And I, I should emphasize that I tried to limit my book to the 20th century as opposed mm -hmm. to our current time of discord. Of and I did that because I, I felt one has more perspective on, on mm -hmm. the past and one can mm -hmm. be slightly, mm -hmm. one can be arguably dispassionate about the past in a way that's difficult mm -hmm. to do right. for the current. Right. Well, as I, I am thinking, of course, the present is relevant, but I'm thinking of the past. I'm thinking of dictators and charismatic leaders and who get people caught up in these political movements. Communism, for instance, as you mentioned. Yeah, I guess one of the intriguing things, in this whole history is the relationship between science brainwashing and the early communist leaders. And that brings us back to Pavlov oh, and yeah. the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. How so? How, how, how does our understanding of Pavlov inform this concept of, dark, of a, a course of persuasion? So the early days of brainwashing go back to the time of Ivan Pavlov's dog labs were in St. Petersburg, in the basement of a physiology building right next to the Neva River. One day, the Neva River flooded, but it was much bigger flood than the typical. And the waters rose and flooded the dog labs. The water rose slowly, and it was so bad that the dogs were bobbing in their crates in the basement of the building and barely able to breathe, just poking their little snouts at the top of the crates, snuffling the air. At the last moment, the dog handler rushed in and had to dunk each dog under the water and open the crate door in order to rescue them. What Pavlov observed was that the dogs were never the same. The they had forgotten all of the meticulously learned behavior. And Pavlov was masterful at shaping behavior. He could train a dog to respond to the note of C, but to ignore a C sharp. It was that precise. The dogs forgot all of this. And also their dispositions changed. Some became aggressive, some submissive. Pavlov talked about this for the rest of his life and turned his attention increasingly to human behavior. One day, Lenin visited Pavlov's lab, and it was much more than a kind of photo op. Lenin spent two hours meeting with Pavlov and discussing his concerns about whether the population of the Soviet Union would truly endorse the beliefs of communism. And Lenin asked Pavlov, can you help? Can you help me reshape the Soviet population to become better communists? And Pavlov said, why, yes, I can. Whereupon Lenin funded Pavlov with an institute staffed by 357 postdocs and research assistants. You have to think about that. This was that kind of level of staffing would be impressive today. But at the time in 1920, with the, the Soviet Union in basically famine and receivership due to the state of the economy, for Lenin to have invested that much effort in supporting Pavlov shows that Lenin expected something back in return. And right. Stalin continued that. Stalin, who so infamously turned on anyone and everyone who was close to him, still protected. Pavlov had the rare luxury for a crucial individual in the Soviet Union in a leadership position. He had the rare luxury to die of old age. That's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And how was his work used then? How did this build the foundation of brainwashing? Pavlov argued that every dog and every person has a breaking point and that medications can help if you're treating someone. He argued that sleep interruption 
could render people and dogs more malleable. And he argued that sensory restriction was important in shaping behavior. Now, the latter is obviously apparent to any of us who train dogs, our own drug dogs. You, you uh, are able to make more progress in training if there aren't a lot of extraneous stimuli going on. So you try to be in a relatively quiet environment when you're trying to train your pet. So Pavlov had certain observations which he gleaned from decades of his work largely with dogs and started applying them to people. He famously argued that people and dogs are this very similar in terms of their behavior. And that was another reason why he was popular with the communists, because the communists were not keen on religion. And Pavlov's materialism was very welcome to them when they were struggling with very conservative Russian Orthodox Church. I see. So you've kind of got me now thinking about torture and the relationship to of persuasion, because you mentioned that everyone has a breaking point. So how are torture and coercive persuasion related? Well, first, let's think what we are trying to do with torture and whether it works. That's a peculiar question, but as a thought exercise, people, torturers inflict pain for different reasons. Some torturers enjoy it, derive sadistic sexual pleasure from doing that. Arguably, that's probably not why governments are imposing torture, but maybe governments do sometimes employ people who enjoy hurting other people for one reason or another. But that's not why intelligence agencies use torture. Intelligence agencies try to extract information. And here is where it gets very cloudy. It's obviously true you can cause pain, anguish to any individual. The data about extracting useful information is surprisingly limited. And it's limited at both extremes of the distribution. There are some people who will not talk despite anguishing amounts of painful stimulation. And then there are many more people who will say anything to get the torture to stop. And from an interrogator's point of view, this latter group of people is very problematic. If I will say anything to you, if I will make up something, if I will try to guess what you're after, are you really getting good information from me? And the answer is no. Right. So a torture can be used as a form of coercive persuasion. And I would think also indoctrination into cults sometimes includes not Maybe not full-on torture, but various aspects of deprivation and lack of creature comforts. Is that right? So, certainly deprivation, certainly isolation, certainly secrecy. I, I think the, interestingly, the use of mandated diaries and confessions is frequently observed in cults and religious groups. Well, it's fascinating you say that. I just watched a documentary on the Nexium cult. India Oxenberg, Catherine Oxenberg's daughter, was pulled into this cult in in relatively recent. And uh, one of their techniques was to have these cathartic sessions where you had these emotional breakthroughs. Well, some of us remember the 60s with a great amount of enthusiasm about encounter groups and personal Mm -hmm. growth groups Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. people were battered around in group settings and insulted, forced to confess, told their confession wasn't adequate. It was very intrusive. It was very harmful. And a lot of that was made its appearance in China and in Korea. And there was the sense that this was such a powerful technique that maybe people really could be brainwashed by it. Now, it's interesting. In the United States, the horror about brainwashing 
came up in the context of the Korean War, the Manchurian, the movie, the Manchurian Man- Candidate. Manchurian Candidate, yes. Um, and the fact that some of our soldiers who were POWs made anti-war propaganda broadcasts. And more frightening yet was that about 20 of our soldiers refused to come home at the time of the armistice. This blew the country's mind. From a QA perspective, my view is that if you've got a a couple hundred thousand souls, you might expect just by random act that a couple of them would do peculiar things. That wasn't the view of the United States. This was, oh my God, what did they do? There were 20 people who refused to come home, who settled in China and Russia, Mm. married, took jobs there. Obviously, this had to be some horrible thing that the Chinese had done. And people pointed a lot to the group pressures, the confessions, the diaries, all of those sorts of things that, of course, we remember this from the Red Guard days in in China. I want to bring Steve in now. Steve, can you give us a little bit of thought about what the the biologic, the neurobiologic underpinnings might be that's going on here in the brainwashing process? Well, I think contemporary neuro, uh, neurobiologists would say this has to do with neuroplasticity. It's interesting that a common mechanism of action of all the drugs that have been used in these sorts of situations and are being reused today for hopefully therapeutic uh, uses, although we've seen them not so therapeutic in what Joel's has been talking about. But it creates a major question in neurobiology. Do you have to have an emotional or a hallucinatory or some sort of a revelatory dissociative experience with neuroplasticity so you can be therapeutic or not? And if you talk to people who've had ayahuasca or, you know, some MDMA, and they're very certain that it's the emotional experience that really is so impressive to them. Having said that, many of these same people that I've seen in my career and practice, they, they, they've had this experience, but they're still, you know, having the same PTSD or uh, depression that they had before they t- had the ayahuasca experience. So I didn't find that particularly compelling as a therapeutic outcome. But neuroplasticity can occur with, in 20 minutes of taking these drugs. And so the idea, Joel talked about a little bit, you know, when you have a memory, it becomes changeable. So the idea of editing your memory comes from some animal work that suggests that, let me give you the memory, let's have it, now let's actually abolish it. So when you first have a memory, you consolidate it. When you have a memory again, it can be changed or eliminated, and that's called reconsolidation. So that means synapse formation, plasticity. So is it possible to direct neuroplasticity towards elimination of bad memories in the hands of well-meaning psychotherapists, or are they going to be diabolical CIA reps uh, trying to make you go to a modern Jonestown? So neurobiology is there, and plasticity is a part of it, and the emotional experiences and having the memories and shaping the memories are the other part. Well, you know, Steve, the third part of, of this trilogy, this series that we'll be doing, you and I will be talking more about neuroplasticity and how it can be a good thing or a bad thing, That's sort of what you're talking about now. Well, that's what I'm just wondering, and is to take Joel's book as, as a very serious lesson and not get ahead of ourselves at how clever or how well-meaning we are. We're playing with fire here. You know, mm-hmm. do we really know what we're doing when we're giving agents that change your your, your thinking patterns and uh, trying to do psychotherapy in a well-meaning, well-intended way, but could we screw it up? And, uh, you know, having hubris and lack of humility of our stupidity and needing to understand the brain has led us into some of the problems of the past. So let's not repeat those as part of what I'm saying. Well, how well can we tease apart thinking and feeling? And uh, I think what Steve is pointing out is that strong feeling certainly influences memory and thinking. And on the other hand, some cognitive restructuring can influence the feeling. So the arrow can go either direction. I, I wonder 
again, it's a question of what's the intention of the patient? What's the intention of the person working with the patient? In right. brainwashing, it's a zero-sum game. What's good for me is not good for the victim. And yes. there's no interest on the brainwasher's part of helping the victim. Actually, let me, let me take that back partially. So Ewan Cameron thought he was helping people. In fact, he was ethically impossibly challenged in terms of consent, etc. And furthermore, he was a miserable scientist as far <laughs> as his technique or design. But he at least thought he was helping people. Jones, as in Jonestown, wasn't trying to help people. Right. And many of these charismatic leaders are not. They're narcissistic, of course, and, and sociopathic, actually. Oh, yeah. I'd like to quickly shift our, the second part of this series. We're really going to be focusing on social media and how that has been used coercively. But, you know, social media, originally there was sort of a utopian aspect to social media. It was going to help connect the world and help us all communicate and, and uh, disseminate information. But there's such a dark side to it. C could we conceive of social media as brainwashing in a way? So we get back to the question of defining brainwashing and then it all starts to follow. Mm -hmm. So if social media is surreptitious, if it's coercive, if it relies on restrictive information, one has to start worrying about this. And certainly from all that we know about how algorithms work in, in social media and how, how they feed increasingly selective information to followers, mm -hmm. how social media seems to be a fertile ground for bullying and extravagant theories about the nature of the world, all of these things have to make one wonder about whether all that wonderful utopianism and optimism we had about social media, whether that needs to be reconsidered. A matter of fact, if you look today, there's probably, I can't think of anything that unites Republicans and Democrats so much as a concern with social media. Now, their, yes. their proposed solutions are going to be different and in our culture that emphasizes freedom of expression, it's going to be very difficult. But social media is, it's a new social contagion. And, you know, we've been through this. New contagious drugs, they sweep through a population and it takes a long time for people to recognize that this drug is dangerous and that one needs to come up with some regulatory framework. Look, we've yes. had automobiles for over 100 years and we're still struggling with drinking and driving. Yes. And when you look at social media, which is so recent and yet it's like a prairie fire that is just yes. burning. And I think we have to take it seriously and come up with some ways of it in such a way that we can live with it. Well, with that, uh, we have run out of time, and I think we've only scratched the surface of your wonderful book and your wonderful work, Dr. Dimstel. I want to thank you so much for meeting with us and sharing your thoughts. And Steve, I want to thank you for your color commentary. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the questions, discussion, and Steve's color commentaries, yeah. always bright and welcomed. Yes. And so I just want to remind folks that we've been speaking with Dr. Joel Dimsdale, a professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry, at University of California, San Diego, and his book is called Dark Persuasion, The History of Brainwashing from Pavlov to Social Media. And I feel like we have taken that journey in just this short hour that we've been together. So thanks, everyone. And stay, stay tuned. Listen to the rest of the, the podcasts that are going to be in this series. This is a three-part series, as we mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. Subscribe today.